Hi there again. And now I have here with me Miss Lela Tyagji. Uh, Lela Ji needs no introduction, really. Uh, she is one of the founders and chairpersons of Dastkar Society for Crafts and Craftspeople, an organization working for the revival of traditional crafts in India. Having studied design in Baroda in Japan, she has worked as a freelance designer in interiors, textiles, crafts, and theater. She writes regularly on crafts, design, development, and social issues. And she has been working with grassroots artisans to augment livelihood for marginalized communities across India for over four decades. Among the many awards and recognitions, Leila Ji has been honored and recognized for her work by the government of India in 2012 with, work, with the Padma Shri Award. Thank you so much, Leila Ji, for joining me here today. Wish you a very happy new year. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be talking about craft since one can't actually be traveling around doing it. This is second best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. So, uh, so the reason, uh, the objective of, of having you here with us uh, today was uh, we want to hear some of your inspiring insights, uh, you know, as a leader uh, in the handmade sector uh, with our audience, which comprises of craft entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, as well as investors who are keen to see more and more uh, global brands in, from the handmade craft sector coming out of India. Uh, so we've got a very keen audience and they'd love to hear from you. So shall we begin? Yes, let's. Okay, great. So the first question I have for you is, uh, in recent times, what do you see as the top uh, two or three highlights uh, that have enabled the progress of the handmade craft sector in India and uh, maybe globally as well? Well, progress is, of course, a sort of question mark word because uh, one of the frustrations, I think, of working in the sector is that you feel that given the huge potential the progress is not commensurate with the potential. And I think there are some reasons for it. However, if you take the immediate present, present I think there are some sort of, uh, you know, highlights of the way the craft sector in India is constructed, which give a lot of hope. And as I said, have potential. And particularly in the context of what is happening in the world today. I mean, I'm talking of COVID, I'm yeah. talking of lockdowns, I'm talking of economic recession. Yeah. And, uh, these are, uh, I think, a huge thing that has happened in the craft sector, certainly um, transformative since I started working in the late 70s in the sector, mm -hmm. is the whole digital revolution. Yeah. Because it has given craftspeople, often rural-based, uh, a direct access to customers and to potential markets, and even more importantly, to the kind of world and lifestyles to which they have to cater today. Because craftspeople no longer really sell in their villages to each other. Craft has become too expensive, too many other kind of mass produced industrial products have come in, uh, which look people in villages are buying. Uh, and so they inevitably have to look to external markets, whether it is the Indian towns and cities yeah. and metros, or whether it is the international market. And for a long time, their only conduit between their own life in the village and their production in the village and their potential customer was through a third party. And sometimes a whole series of people, layers of buyers and people who came, they could be small traders who then sold to bigger traders, who sold to exporters, who sold to lifestyle stores, et cetera, et cetera. But now there's a much more direct way in which craftspeople can interact, uh, interact and also understand what people in the cities want. Mm -hmm. They can actually just on their smartphones take a look at their customers, see the kind of homes that they live in, see the kind of clothes that they're wearing, see the kind of uh, the colors and trends that are going on. And they can therefore interpret it according to the skill that they have themselves. And that has made a huge difference. Of course, even more so during COVID times, 
where the real time markets and uh, buyers are no longer, you know, either visiting them or and no crowds people traveling to bazaars and exhibitions in the cities. But now at least there is some communication. Uh, they can talk to them, they can uh, sort of receive orders, they can develop products, et cetera. And that has made a huge difference. In the last two years, I've done so much design development online. Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, of course, it's not the same as a person-to-person -person contact and to actually be working with the materials and things with your own hands. But it is something which has made a huge change. And, you know, even a village embroiderer who may be either neoliterate or perhaps even illiterate, everyone understands a thumbs up, everyone understands a photograph. So you send an image, uh, she sends you a little bit, uh, a shot of what she's working on. You can say good, you can say, you know, you can scribble on the image and send it back. It's really quite revolutionary. And since craftspeople are creative people, they have understood this media very well, and they use it quite uh, effectively. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's a huge difference. So technology has actually got our craftspeople much closer to customers directly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and they are able to create together. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and of course, COVID, as you said, was the trigger point to, to make this technological uh, yeah. uh, adoption much faster. Yeah, even things like going online, having their own websites, you know, putting up their photographs of their products. But I think more important than the marketing aspect, mm -hmm. which still needs a lot of fine tuning because they have to learn how to take good photographs, how to do, you know, product display, how to uh, sort of put interesting, to create that branding, is this fact that now they do have a much more direct eye on their potential customer and the potential market. Mm -hmm. And that has them being much more in control mm -hmm. of uh, their production and their sales and uh, their potential markets uh, than they were before. I remember the time when we started the sky where even to send a telegram took about a week, you know, to rural Bihar or Madhya Pradesh. And now you're there, you know, you can see and chat with each other the way I'm chatting with you. And that's quite exciting. Mm. So that is one thing. Yeah. Uh, the other thing uh, is that, uh, I mean, there's always a silver lining to every cloud, however black. And one of the silver linings of this dreadful COVID cloud, which has engulfed us for the last 22 months, has been that I think worldwide, it has made people reflect a little mm -hmm. about what is important, what is thing, and that things like fast fashion or having to change your, your clothes and your colors and your sort of products every few months mm -hmm. uh, is not really the best way to be. Mm -hmm. And when people no longer are going out so much, and they're living in their own homes, the way that they want their homes to be, to reflect their own personalities, mm -hmm. maybe in their own cultures, uh, uh, or to, you know, contemporize uh, things to suit their own personalities mm -hmm. rather than what some buyer sitting in New York or Paris has dictated is going to be the color story of the year. Mm -hmm. Now all seems rather ridiculous. And I think that uh, as a result, we have seen a much greater appreciation and a coming back to uh, the whole beauty of handmade, of classic, mm -hmm. of that, uh, you know, this whole thing of following trends, of, you know, you know, branding, all that. I think people have realized that one, it's a very wasteful way of living and spending. Mm -hmm. The other is that it's not really necessary. I think since lifestyles themselves have changed, people are not socializing the way they are. So being comfortable in your own skin and in your own roots, being more rooted to what you are as a person mm -hmm. has become more important than keeping up with the Joneses. And I think that has been very good for craft because uh, I think uh, this whole thing of handmade, of green processes, of 
you know, uh, less of a carbon footprint, all those things, which used to be things that people talked about, but really did very little about because there was so much pressure mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, to do that. I think all that has changed and you see it even in what uh, design houses and merchandisers, the way they are talking and the way they are planning, they're no longer, you know, sort of into this whole seasonal thing. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I mean, you know, to plan and produce only for a season, yeah. and that whole season may be completely wiped out because you're house bound by COVID, it doesn't make sense. Mm. I think that has been very good for craftspeople and mm. people are learning to appreciate uh, the assets of craft, the economies of craft, and the ecological values of craft production. And that's become mainstream, and this is yeah. the really point. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, given given this context and you know everything that's been going well, uh, what is the one or maybe more innovations that you'd like to see? in this industry that has not yet happened? Well, I think the thing that really hasn't happened in, and I'm talking in the Indian context, sure. that uh, because we have had these millions of craftspeople for millions of years, I mean, thousands of years, uh, we actually don't look at it in a very, um, sort of in a perspective of, growth and inclusion uh -huh. pack up all our craftspeople into this little thing package of you know tradition and culture and aesthetic a little bit of the past and also slightly i won't say primitive but as something that really doesn't contact uh, you know uh, fit in with this developing economic powerhouse which india wants to be and to me, that seems very short-sighted because after all, this is one unique asset that India has while it is trying to catch up with the rest of the sort of industrialized world. Right. And this is an extraordinary asset. And I think we have to, I'm always surprised at how we don't realize the potential of this huge, huge sector, which we have, which no other country in the world has. And these literally thousands of very distinctive and extraordinary skill sets that these millions of practitioners have. They're not, uh, you know, uh, practicing some very primitive activity, you know, just sitting and whittling and making some rubbish. I mean, these are knowledge systems and skills that have been honed over the centuries and can produce the most extraordinary things. And these are not just pairs of hands, but they are skilled professionals. Yeah. Why we don't realize that and invest in them the way that we do in other sort of sectors of the economy, I simply can't understand because it is one very obvious growth area. But because it's always been there, we sort of take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And we look at it as we look at the Taj Mahal or the Qutub Minar and say, well, it's always been there and it's always, you know, will be there. And it's a great tourist attraction, but we don't think of it as a, as I said, an economic asset which needs investment. Mm -hmm. Just as every other uh, sector of the economy does need investment, because craftspeople are very skilled. They are professionals, mm -hmm. but like every other industry, they need investment in better technology, in R and D, mm -hmm. in um, fin finances to buy appropriate raw material for proper storage for packaging they have to learn also the tricks of you know uh, merchandising and marketing mm -hmm. the whole area of life which has become more and more sophisticated yeah and they have to do all that and for that they need investment and they, it's not something yes craftspeople people have survived and particularly again in the covid context they have survived uh, because they are independent, they are resilient, they are uh, they have a lot of uh, endurance because they usually own their own businesses, they work out of their homes, the raw material and infrastructure isn't very expensive. But if they want to grow and develop and professionalize, then they do need investment, mm -hmm. and they also need uh, the kind of 
packaging and promotion that uh, in order to tell people, not just internationally, but even in India, to tell young Indians about this extraordinary wealth we have and the potential of that wealth and the part that they can play in you know, using it as a way for their own entrepreneurial growth. So uh, I think that uh, I'm sorry that we always treat craft as some sort of very isolated, special, you know, rather twee little activity that goes on. Mm. I mean, there are about 200 million artisans in India mm. and literally thousands of different skills. It's yeah. not that all these millions are all making the same thing. There's no assembly line. Yeah. There are these little pockets of skilled communities, mm. uh, each with a tradition that is quite unique to India mm. and which other people in the world really envy us. I mean, the Chinese are always coming over to India to take craftspeople from here to train theirs. But somehow in India, we have a bit of a blind spot about it. We take it far too much for granted. Mm -hmm. So it is a strategic asset that deserves uh, a lot more uh, focus and yeah. be nurtured and, and we need to be proud of our, uh, you know, this, this big strength area. We need area. to nurture it, we need to promote it, we need to invest in it, hmm. and we need to also um, equip craftspeople themselves to make the most of their assets hmm. by, uh, you know, teaching them the kind of uh, more urban skills that we have and uh, you know doing a partnership between their skills and ours mm -hmm. and not separating them and saying that okay you know this is these are we are english speaking computerized uh, able to take uh, you know photographs and make videos and things and you can make this little object and you know you sit in your corner and make it uh, i don't i don't i think they have this has to be integrated into something which becomes a really professional sector of our Indian economy. Wonderful. So with that, uh, what would be your uh, New Year wish for uh, this year, for 2022, for the entire craft sector, for all our craft entrepreneurs? Well, I think my wish is the wish that we all have, not for just for craftspeople, but for all of us, that COVID would go away and we could get back to life and use normal life but also use the lessons that we have learned over these last two years and the thoughts and introspection that we've done and mm. put that into practice. That's, but at the moment, it seems a slightly long way of go. At the moment, the figures in Delhi are just rising and rising. And I think we, it's going to be some time before we can do that. Uh, well, until then, we have the opportunity to, to pivot and use this yeah. uh, as an opportunity to see what does it take to grow. Yeah, uh, I think I think it is a good time for reflection, for mm. uh, for planning, mm. and uh, it's something that we all need to do because I think it would be very short-sighted for us to say, "Okay, now there's no COVID, let's go back to life as it was." <laughs> I don't think life will ever be quite the same. Sure, and sure, I hope it will be better. And in fact, you 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 said this earlier that you know the silver lining in the middle of all that crisis was the ability to have. Discover so there's something that's shifted which has actually been in favor of the industry and yeah. that's wonderful. i think it has shifted i mean if i can just add another couple of sentences that i sure. think the shift has been not only in the awareness of the consumer mm. about the value of craft and its long-term assets to us as a society mm -hmm. but also to craft people themselves who were and still are, I mean, every decade we lose about 10% of our craftspeople in India. They leave the sector and they go, they move to the cities or they move to different types of jobs. And that's mainly because they feel that uh, there's not much of a future here, yeah. uh, not just in terms of earning, but in terms of the social recognition that craftspeople don't get sure. in society. Yeah. But I think COVID has taught them that uh, craft in a way is a very useful asset to have because it enables you to bounce back because you already have the skill with you. Uh, you don't necessarily have an employer in a factory which has closed down or mm -hmm. somebody who hasn't paid you 
you know, for not working, you, you, you know, you, you yourself are intact mm. with your own working thing. It may be small, mm. but so it's, it's easier to revive your activity and your economy than it is for a lot of other people in the job sector. Wonderful. So, I, so I think that, uh, I mean, in conversations that I've had with young craftspeople, hmm. they are recognizing that and saying that, you know, and many of them have actually come back perhaps from a city job, working in an office or something, and yeah. coming back to their homes and, you know, rejoining the family craft business. Uh-huh. As they okay. see that it, it does give you a certain security. It does give you, and it gives you a slightly unique status in the job market. Well, that's wonderful to hear uh, that this is actually happening at, at the grassroots. Uh, Leila ji, thank you so much for your time. It's been so wonderful to talk to you. And uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us here. Not at all. Thank you for talking to me. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.